You're listening to The Jam Price Show, all about movies. And today, my guest is award-winning director, producer, editor, musician. The list goes on and on. <laughs> Peter Bick. And we're going to be talking about his new uh, uh, four-part documentary series entitled Roots So Deep, You Can See the Devil Down There. <laughs> what a great title, Peter. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. It's nice to be here. It's good to have you here. This is a very topic that's near and dear to my heart, and I have actually uh, covered a couple of other documentaries around this topic about our soil and how mm -hmm. important our soil is. I'm sure you're familiar with Common Ground. Sure, of course. And, um, and there's a new one, Wilding. Do you know about Wilding? I haven't heard about Wilding. I have to check it out. You definitely have to check it out because that was an experiment done in England on ah. a centuries-old farm that they inherited over yep. and over. And th what they did, they discovered somebody in another, I want to say in Norway or something, who was having um, wild animals come. They had like boars, just like you're similar to what your story is, coming back and regenerating the, yep. the yep. land. And it's been it, over years and years. And the same thing, species were starting to come back that hadn't come. So it's very interesting. You know, this is a topic that's, a very hot topic that's very important. So I really wanted to have you on the show to discuss this. So well, I appreciate um, that. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, tell me how you got started in this. Well, basically, uh, I came in through the climate change concerned portal. Uh, made a movie called uh, Carbon Nation, which was about solutions to climate change. And in the making of that movie, it became very clear that if we treat our soils well, they can be a solution for climate change. And if we treat our soils poorly, then they can be an emitter of carbon and therefore a problem with climate change. And what I didn't know was how integral everything was beyond that. And that soil attract, you know, uh, soil, healthy soil created water cycling that was in the positive. Farms were more resilient in droughts and floods, both because healthy soil soaks up rain and also holds on to moisture in the droughts. And so I came in through concern about climate change, but quickly became uh, an advocate for farmers and a lover of farmland that's being treated really well. And that's being the food being produced in concert with nature as opposed to fighting nature. Yeah. And you now, how long did it take you to gather all of these scientists yeah. and then pick out the various farms? you are several different states. Uh, Tennessee, Alabama, what, Mississippi, and I'm missing in, one. In Kentucky, yeah. In Kentucky, uh, you know, all wonderful uh, uh, states. And, you know, how did you pick? The, the, I, that's a two part question. First, how did you gather your team together? Let's yep. start with that question. So, when I decided to focus on soils as a solution, like one solution I'm going to focus on in 2012, the serendipity of of things just, I kept meeting scientists who were also really interested in healthy soil and really interested in grazing as a solution. And, and the way people were grazing was making the land better as opposed to making the land worse. And so that science team came together organically over pretty much a year. And we all got together at the beginning of 2014, all wanting to compare adaptive grazing with conventional grazing. And so, that's how the team got together. And then it shifted a little bit over the years because from 2014 to 2018 was all designing the research project, fundraising, designing, fundraising, long process just to even get out into the field and start measuring. The farms themselves, we focused on the Southeast US as our first region. We wanted to do nine regions, but it took almost five years just to raise the money for one region. So we focused on the Southeast first. And actually our team is up in the Northern Great Plains now beyond the Roots So Deep docu-series and the science, but we're we're doing you know science in a totally different ecosystem. And so the farms, what we did was we sent out a survey uh, and we got about 90 back that felt like they were close to the adaptive methods that we were looking at. And 25 of those were worth scouting. And of those 25, we we scouted them and we picked four. And then we were told to check out this one fella, John Lyons, en route as we were scouting and he became the fifth. And so we had the adaptive farmers. Now we needed to find neighbors who were grazing and the sort of the, 
the way everybody in that county was grazing, the average way to graze, conventional grazing. And they also had the same, they also had to have the same soil type as the farmers we selected. And we got really lucky. Three of the farms were right across the fence and two of the farms are right down the road. And the folks we asked all said yes with some reservations, but they said yes. And that's how we found both sides of the fence. And not only did we get lucky with the farmers, the, the adaptive farmers, we were absolutely selecting for the best. We got really good conventional farmers as well. We just, we got lucky. And we got lucky that they were all pretty interesting people, very interesting people, good on camera, very different stories. So there was a lot of luck for, for this thing. I would say so. Were any of them doing the adaptive farming before you approached them? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The five that we picked, they'd been doing it for one guy, one family for seven years. Everybody else for fifteen to twenty to twenty-five years. Yeah. Wow. So we that was a criteria that they had to have been doing whatever method, conventional or adaptive. They had to have been doing that for at least five years. That was our criteria. One was seven years. The rest were much, much more than that. Okay. So then again, how do you go and find those people? I mean, you were lucky to find them, but how did you go about finding them? I mean, did you put an ad out there? or was We there put a, a survey in magazines. Yeah, we put a survey out and that's how we got that 90 back, the surveys back, and then picked 25 to go look at and then picked five to make it onto the, onto the science, to the team itself. Wow. wow. And we didn't ask farmers to change. A, one of our scientists, John Lundgren, he always says this, that the farmers are 20 years ahead of the science. So we just wanted to measure what the farmers were doing. We weren't trying to change them or make them do something that they weren't already doing. We were just measuring the carbon and the nitrogen, in the soil, the bugs above and below ground, the microbial life, the wildlife of birds, the greenhouse gases, the animal health, farmer well-being. The plants, are they nutritious or not? Are they a lot? Are they a lot of biodiversity of plants? Or is it just a couple plants? That's the things that we were measuring. So we just had to find farmers who were willing to be a part of this research. And they all were. It was amazing. We're very lucky. I've said that a, I've said that a few times and I mean it. <laughs> <laughs> you were very lucky. Yeah. Now, how did, they, you know, if they've been doing it for 25 years, and, and again, I'll go back to wilding a little bit, because they kind of started this, I, I want to say in the 80s, I mean, you know, when mm -hmm. they started doing what they were doing. Right. And again, similar, different, you know, but similar, same thing about our soil, you know, how, I mean, again, who, I don't think anybody thinks about it. I don't think Americans really think about how important our soil is. And so it's been, you know, kind of eye opening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's why I love what I do because I get such an education. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so many wonderful documentaries on so many different topics. And it's just like advanced learning for me, mm -hmm. you know, and I hope it is for my guests too. I mean, my, my listeners uh, to the show, uh, because it is, it's always, you know, you learn new things constantly, but how did this all come about? How long has it been going on? As I said, Wilding, I think started in the 80s. How did somebody come up with the idea and even start to think about it? Well, really, you can go back to um, the Old Testament and they're talking about grazing as a solution where you're supposed to let the land rest every seven years. But it, what it says is actually graze it every seven years so that you can get it fertilized. So then you can start growing all the other stuff the next six years and then let it rest from growing the row crops, but graze it so it gets fertilized. So this is very old. The idea of moving animals in a sort of tight pack and letting them be on a piece of land for a short period of time so they only eat half the forage and then move them on. A guy named Andre Voisson in the 50s was talking about doing this stuff. He called it rational grazing. Alan Savory came in the 70s and 80s, and he was calling it holistic planned grazing. And then there's folks who call it mob grazing or strip grazing. Uh, managed intensive grazing was a name. And when we came together as a team in 2014, we thought the phrase adaptive needed to be added to it. That that, that was a really key component for the, for the scientists on our team who were doing these methods as ranchers themselves. We had folks who were both ranchers and scientists on our team and for the folks that we had studied as well. And so that's why we call it adaptive multi-paddock grazing. It's just really the key is adaptive. And so it's been sort of an evolution of ideas. Things change, things get, farmers are the ones who evolve the ideas. Farmers are the ones who are making this change and that change. And it's just sort of a growing adaptive 
method that you have sort of general rules, you, you know, moving your animals once a day or more is kind of a basic rule. Keeping them all in one herd has become very popular and very effective. Only letting them eat half and leave the rest to cover the soil so it stays cool and moist. That's becoming kind of one of the universal rules. Beyond that, it's up to the farmer on their land that day, that week, that moment of how they do it, where they put their animals. They never do the same thing on the on the same piece of land at the same time of year. It's always changing. And that's why we thought adaptive was a good word to add to the to the lexicon. And so it's been growing forever. But really, when when folks put fences around ranches and farms, and then let the animals just sort of roam edge to edge. That's when it changed for the animals. That's when it changed. They would go eat what they wanted and they wouldn't eat what they didn't want. And so the stuff they didn't want would grow up. The stuff they did like, they'd eat away. They, A lot of farmers let their animals graze it very close to the ground because they think it's wasteful not to eat all the forage. But what's counterintuitive is if you leave half, your farm itself will actually grow two to three to four times more forage in a year. If you just only eat half at a time and then let most of the farm rest. Don't let the animals go all the way to the edges of the land. Keep them tight, move them frequently. So that's that's the sort of evolution. And who knows what's going to happen next week or next year or next decade? Who's thinking the new cool stuff? Right, right, right. And that's why regenerative farming, the same similar you know, concepts with that also and so i do like one of the things that uh that you that i saw read when i was doing the research is that there's going to be a certification or, or there's something there is a certification for farmers who do use adaptive so when people go to buy food and things like that then they right. know um that, that this came from just like we want to go you know the free range you know no antibiotics you yep. know all of the other things that we all want to know before we start putting things in our bodies yep. uh, because it's very what we eat is has i think has a great deal to deal to do with what our health is our ultimate yep. health uh so is that something that is been is it done finished or are they, are they able to do that or is that something that's in the process well we know of different groups that are coming up with different methods i'd say the groups that are actually doing on the ground measurement and and aren't relying on the farmer to report what they're doing so it's a little it's more based on science and and observation by a third party those are the folks that are i think going to be the ones who kind of win this next layer of putting a stamp on things there's a whole lot of fighting and skirmishing and things like that out there. But if you're measuring what the farmer's doing, that then becomes a ground truthing. And so that a consumer can really trust that and the company that sells it can really trust it. So that's what I would say would be the, the criteria that people are, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a wild west out there right now with different, different badges. But it's, so you, you covered, I mean, it really is done very well. You, um, the, the farmers and how they've been doing it for you know, doing the adaptive and then as you say their neighbors and friends you know who are doing conventional and whether you felt the question that you're posing in this film in this series is whether the ones who've been doing the conventional whether they'd be willing to change and start doing right. the adaptive farming so let's yeah. talk about that yeah so we had two questions the first question was, would our research show that the adaptive was beneficial or not? We right. didn't know. And so that was a big question. And that was a big gamble and millions of dollars to ask that question and do the science and do the research and the analysis. If the adaptive or the conventional showed it was beneficial, would we get the farmers to change? Now, we had an opinion based on a lot of observation that we thought the adaptive would be beneficial over the conventional because we'd met a number of farmers. I'd met tons of farmers who changed from adaptive to ad, changed from conventional to adaptive and they got themselves out of debt and they had a whole lot of benefits happen. So that's kind of had an inkling, but we didn't have the data. We didn't have hard data. So would the data show that adaptive is been more beneficial than conventional? And what if, you know, it was better for some things and not better for other things. Those are the things we didn't know. But then if the adaptive showed that it was beneficial over the conventional, would the conventional farmers change? 
And that was a big question. And we did not know the answer to that until the very end. I, I, I know that's, that's an episode four answer and that's yeah. sort of like a spoiler, right? So, so right. we don't we'll talk about it unless, you know, until it's well known, which, you know, at this point it's building. Um, but we we're in it to help farmers and, and, um, and the farmers on both sides, the sides of the fence knew that. They, I think it took a little while for folks to understand that on the conventional side. Are we really here to be helpful? And, um, you know, we were, and we are. And so helping farmers is the whole name of this project. It's, it's the reason for the project. And, and we hope we can help a whole lot of farmers because I'd like to see farmers get out of debt. I'd like to see farmers, you know, having healthy water cycles on their land and, 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 and not having to, you know, have a lot of operating expenses that the neighbors don't, you know, it's just that, that, math. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Say that. I was just saying, it's just math. It's like, <laughs> yeah. can you save money, work the same hours, but do it in a way that you enjoy it more, see your animals more because you're moving them. A lot of people think if you move your animals every day or once more than once a day, that's more work. It's actually not more work. It's just different work. And by seeing your animals that much, you're actually catching any animals that aren't healthy fast and so then your your medicine bills go way down because you're catching the one that's unhealthy before it could infect others and i've met farmers that it used to take them months to find all their cattle on a big ranch in the west months until they put all their animals in one herd and made their paddocks a lot smaller so they knew where all their animals were every day and so it's a lot of time saving. It's a lot of, it's a lot of uh, efficiency for the farmer, and then a lot of money saved as well. You know, a lot of money saved. And they're saving money by. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about how they're saving money by doing it this way? Right. So if the animals are healthier, your health care bills. I've just had so many farmers and ranchers tell me they're paying ten percent of what they used to pay in medicine. And why is that, Peter? What because the animals are getting a much better diet. They're getting a much more varied diet. Uh, they're moving frequently, so they're not staying in the same area where, where diseases might be coming up through, you know, stomach worms and stuff through the manure that they're able to, that manure, they won't be back in that field that they pooped in for months. And so that poop has been recycled into the soil. The fly larvas and all that stuff have been recycled, you know, lived their lives, their 28 days, and the animals aren't back until way after that 28 day cycle. So that's on the health side. Um, the adaptive farmers don't grow hay and, and they feed hay much less of the year than the conventional farmers. So the conventional farmers need a lot more hay because of the way they're grazing, their, their land is not producing as much forage. That when the adaptive farmers who are moving their animals frequently and letting the land rest more, they're actually producing a lot more forage, so they don't need as much hay. And when you grow hay, you have a lot of expenses. You have to have a tractor. You have to buy seed. You have to plant it, so that's run, so that's fuel. You then have to fertilize it, so that's very expensive and a gamble. If it doesn't rain a certain amount of days after you put the fertilizer down, you've kind of blown it. It's just bad, bad luck. Then you have to mow it and hope that it doesn't rain in those three days after you mow it. So it'll be dry by the time you then bale it. And then you have to put it and stack it in a barn. And then you have to take it and put it out. So there's a lot of work in there that has a lot of money involved in there. And so the adaptive farmers aren't putting fertilizer on their land. They're not putting nitrogen fertilizer out yet. They're, soil is healthier you know i can give you that much out of episode four and so it's 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 kind of a, a win 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 for the farmer and then everyone asks well why isn't everyone doing it because not a lot of people are doing it yet and then a lot of farmers just aren't being taught these methods whether they're at ag school or wherever it is so that's why there are so many films out there right now is because we want the farmers to know this is an option and and so that's our goal right now is letting farmers know that this is an option and letting consumers, you were talking about badges and things like that. I got to give a shout out to my friends who do have a badge. It's called Regenified. They are going on the farms measuring, being very rigorous. And so, 
you know, we want consumers to know they have a choice of what they're buying. And then does that then cycle up to the big food companies to know consumers want this? And really, to me, the the conversation with the big food companies that I've had for a decade and I'll still have as long as it takes is your supply chain is based on soils that are really degraded at this point in time and is creating climate greenhouse gas emissions, like climate warming greenhouse gas emissions in a big amount. We can now show you there's methods to turn that emissions into sinks, actually where greenhouse gases net are being drawn down and cooling, producing healthier food for your customers and creating healthier soils, which makes your entire supply chain more resilient. And so it's really a, a just a basic business, good business practice to have a resilient supply chain in a in a world where weather events are spiking wetter, drier, you know, it's crazy right now. It's, a, it's like Hunter Lovins called it once, global weirding. You know, it's everything. <laughs> it's not just warming. It might even be extra cooling there, or really wet here. And, you know, you could see droughts and, and floods in a state within a month, you know. And I've seen maps now where it's showing a freeze and a fire warning, like very, it, it, at the, you know, very close in the same region. It's like, freeze warning, fire warning. I've never seen those two things on the map at the same time. And so how do we make farmers more resilient? How do we make our supply chain more resilient? How do we produce healthier food for everybody, right? It's all connected. And then it makes the land healthier. So it mitigates flooding downstream. It, it creates more rain. Like when you have more plant cover on land, there's gonna be more rain. It's, it's, it's a cycle. And so there's just so many benefits that it keeps me charged, completely charged. You know I what I mean? I know what you mean. I can tell. Yeah. I can yeah. tell. Well, there are. I mean, that was there's so many things in this, you know, the microbes and how important they are, right. you know, and that was fascinating. Like, well, if we don't have microbes, we won't have a planet. You know? Yeah, you'll you know, basically everybody... die, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, you we... know, who thinks about microbes? <laughs> you know, so it's funny. I mean, it's an eye opening. You go, yeah. oh, microbes. Like, oh, those are really important that we need to have those. You know, the, but you know, we've heard over and over again all the cattle. I mean, all the people, you know, who are, yep. are, whatever. I won't go that, down that path. But I know here how much the cattle is creating. You yep. know, um, you know the the methane gas that is creating supposedly, you know, our climate more than cars do, and is creating our climate change. And yet, yep. in this film, you show how. The opposite is true by doing this type of adaptive farming. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, the farming itself existed well before we started this project, but we were intrigued by it, right? Um, there's no doubt that cattle emit methane. That's just a fact. And because the adaptive farmers create a lot more forage because of the way they're grazing, they can actually have more animals on their land than their neighbor because they can feed more animals. So there's that's an in, that's an economic benefit for the farmer. It's not on the cost side, it's on the profit side. And so if you have two or three times the amount of cattle in your land, you're gonna have more methane coming out of the cattle. It's just, a, it's just math. With all those animals urinating and, and doing all their work on top at the soil surface with their hooves and, and other factors and microbes, like you mentioned, there's more nitrous oxide on the farm that has a lot more cattle grazing. And so these farms have more methane and more nitrous oxide. Both of those are warming greenhouse gases. But what's happening is because they're growing so much more forage with much deeper roots, they're drawing down so much carbon, which is a cooling because they're drawing it down out of the atmosphere and it's going into the soil, that the, the effect of cooling eclipses the warming gases. So there's so much more cooling going on than there is warming going on that this system, which is based on nature, it's based on 3.2 billion years of R&D, starting with those microbes, then to the grasslands, then to the animals that graze the grasslands, that we're just seeing that when farmers are working with nature, nature is working for them and us. We all benefit when there's a cooling event because of the way these animals are grazed. So it's just a it's not what people who don't want people to eat meat are expecting to hear. Right. And um, 
But to me, it's great news because we're showing a way to draw down more greenhouse gas than we're emitting. It's great news. And we need more science, no doubt. Our team's just done a really strong job of doing science, no doubt. And we're doing it in other regions and we're hoping to advise other science teams around the world that are doing it. So there's no doubt we don't, there's there's every reason that we need more research. That's very but what we're showing in the Southeast US is incredibly compelling. Very, very, very compelling. All right, I can't let you, let you go unless we talk about um, the, the, the people who put money into your film, yeah. <laughs> McDonald's and Shell, yep. who yep. we would not think would be the, uh, the people who would fund this kind of movie, uh, documentary. Yep. So let's yep. talk a bit about that and why that was important too. I, yeah, really, I think Absolutely. it was very, very important. On our, you know, what we haven't already said is our website's rootsodeep.org and that's where people can stream the series. Okay. So rootsodeep.org is where we, we're streaming it on our, we're doing it independently. So it's up on our website. Also on our website is a button that says research. We can read all the published research we've done to date. We have an incredible collection of related research. And we also have uh, the history of all the funding. So I, I have a uh, detailed, not long, but detailed essay of every dollar that we received. We've, we've never said that this shouldn't be said. We've never tried to hide from it. We went to the big companies because we think the big companies have the resources to fund this massive change that needs to happen in agriculture. We went to McDonald's because they're a big company. I think 1% of all people on earth eat at McDonald's every day. Like it's a huge opportunity. And so the fact that they chose to fund our science it's not because our science is going to show that everything they're doing is great and that the meat industry is in great shape and that there's no problem. Our research does not say that. Our research says the meat industry needs to change completely. So that's a very different thing. That's not greenwashing. That's like, hello, <laughs> you guys just funded a very difficult conversation. We went to the fossil fuel companies because they've made so much money from from fossil fuel use that I use, I use it all the time. I'm gonna be flying to Europe, I'm gonna be flying to South Africa in a couple of weeks. I, I use fossil fuels. My camera's made out of fossil fuels, my glasses when I wear them, fossil fuels, my cell phone, my computer. I am no innocent in this whole game. Even my gaff tape is fossil fuels, my tennis racket. And so we said to them, you guys have made so much money from this use of carbon why don't you use the carbon cycle to bring down the carbon? Why don't you guys help us do the research to see if this is indeed a solution? Now, that's what we said to them 10 years ago. We now know it is a solution. And it's not to let the fossil fuel companies continue what they're doing unabated for the, forever. There's a lot of people working on ways of transportation and aviation and trucking and trains where we won't need those fossil fuels. I'm not trying to keep fossil fuels in business. I'm not trying to put them out of business because I don't know how. And I'm we trying don't know to how long it will take to have that ever happen to. <laughs> it, it's gonna happen. It's I wanna use the resources to help fund the research and then the transition. And so that's why we went to the fossil fuel companies. Um, and we've had interest, non-interest, blocking. We've had the whole gamut of, and it's really, this is the most important thing, Jan, the whole most important thing of all that with companies and funding, it's one person. It's never the company yeah. that's writing that check. It's one somebody. person or two people. And somebody it's who believes the, in what you're doing. Oh, Peter, I, I wish we could continue talking. Our time is out. So give yep. your website one more time so people yep. can see this really, really important um, documentary, the four part. I appreciate you. I appreciate yeah, documentary. you. So what is it again? RootsSoDeep.org. RootsSoDeep.org. Dot org. Okay. And we'll put that in all of our social media posts when we put it out too. So thank yep. you, Peter. Lovely having you on the show. Continued success. Look forward to having you back on with your next documentary. There you go, Jan. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.